Just got the thumbs up from our operational tour guide. The board is now <laughs> convened, reconvened into open session at 6.09. Jennifer, would you mind starting us off on the pledge, please? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. The floor is now open for any comments. Do we have any comment cards? Yes. I will suspend the reading of the summary. Oral reports. Agenda item 8.1. Report out of closed session. No action was taken. 8.2. Receive a report from student board member Ms. Cabalanga. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Kakish, and community members. I'm excited to share about the great events, activities, and accomplishments happening at our elementary school sites. The House of Hawks had a fun and busy month at Anna Haas Elementary. The students had a breakout for RTM, Practicalis, house activity, second trimester movie, field trips, and promotion pictures. Upcoming events include a fifth grade field trip, first grade field day, second field day, preschool kinder promotion, student barbecue, yearbook signing day, second grade field trip, graduation. It has, been a it has been a busy last several weeks at Brookside. The first grade students participated in a math glow party. Grades three to five completed their cast testing. The second grade team had a great time at the Traveling Tide Pools field trip, and TKK is making great strides to finish out school year. Upcoming events include a fifth grade field trip, house winners field trip, grades one through five fifth field day, TKK field day, third trimester awards, promotion, yearbook signing party, and end of the year celebrations. At Palm Innovation Academy, the Panthers have been very busy. Students enjoyed an exciting outdoor BMX assembly. They also appreciated and treated their wonderful volunteers to a nacho bar. Teacher Appreciation Week was celebrated with many treats and food for their staff. The first graders performed for parents using their character strong SEL songs. They also hosted an evening family night with an outdoor movie under the stars. At Sundance Elementary, on Monday, May 15th, their new teachers celebrated the completion of their induction program, CTI. They were accompanied by the coaches to recognize their achievements. They also celebrated their film festival winners and Million Bird Club achievers. At Three Rings Ranch Elementary, during the month of May, our PTA put on an amazing family game night for our students, parents, and families. The House of Zell were rewarded for demonstrating the Three Rings of Success with the trimester game truck experience. We held an appreciation brunch for our PTA, school site council, and English Learner Advisory Council. We appreciate all their countless hard hours of hard work. At Tournament Hills Elementary, in May, they were busy celebrating their entire staff. Day of the Teacher, Teacher Appreciation Week, and Classified Appreciation Week. Their career day was a blast. They appreciate Bowman High School Culinary Program and Engineering Department for supporting this event. They also thank the local Bowman Police and Fire Department. Beaumont High School seniors returned to Tournament Hills to open their fifth grade time capsules. What a trip going back in time for students. At Summer Wind Trail School, the Trailblazers cheered on the girls' middle school soccer team as they beat San Gorgonio in Mountain View Middle School as they advanced to the finals. The entire fourth through eighth grade Summer Wind Band concert was a hit, and they celebrated as their students played together in joint unison. Many of the students played solo pieces, and they celebrated the eighth grade band students moving on. The fifth grade students had an adventure for their field trip and they were able to get a tour of the Riverside Police Department. The staff and students came together to support the school's first Girls on the Run 5K. <laughs> this club aims to improve emotional, physical, and behavioral skills to navigate life experiences. The parents were outstanding in assisting this club get off and running. Before I conclude, I'd like to say a few words to thank you for the opportunities to serve as a student board member. I've learned so much, not just from this semester, but throughout the whole year. It's been an honor getting to see firsthand the care that is placed in making decisions that impact this district. I would also like to express my gratitude for the guidance and mentorship that has allowed me to grow both personally and professionally. I'm grateful for the valuable lessons I've learned from my time as student board member. Thank you. 
my fellow student board member, Braxton Swartz, would also like to come up to the podium to say a few words. Good evening, Board of Trustees, Superintendent Kakish, and community members. I want to take a moment to express my heartfelt gratitude and extend my sincere thanks for allowing me to, sorry, for allowing me the incredible opportunity to serve on the Beaumont USD Board. It was an honor and a privilege that I did not take lightly, and I am truly grateful for the trust and confidence you placed in me. Being a part of the board has been an enriching experience, allowing me to actively contribute to the growth and development of our educational community. The chance to work alongside such dedicated individuals, including yourselves, who share a passion for advancing the well-being and academic excellence of our students has been both inspiring and rewarding. Thank you. Thank you, Braxton. <coughs> Agenda item 8.3, receive a report from the student Excuse me, <laughs> the student superintendent. Um, <laughs> receive a report from the superintendent. You, your, your speech just really tore me up inside. Um, and review the district calendar for the month of June. Good evening, everyone. Last Tuesday, the Board of Trustees, Cabinet, and several of our administrators attended the dinner celebration uh, for Student of the Year 22-23 school year. Among the students of the month, Arian Sibley uh, from 21st Century Learning Institute and Jacob Reyes from Beaumont High School were selected as, uh, as student of the year. They received $2,500 scholarship for their higher education studies. Every month we look forward for the students uh, of the month breakfast. There is always tears in the audience because our students have really challenging stories that they share with us and yet they persevere over, uh, overcoming all of these obstacles. So we're so proud of them and they're an inspiration for all of us. We're continuing to celebrate our staff during the month of May. This week we recognize and celebrate our classified team for classified school employees appreciation week uh, from our secretaries to custodians, child nutrition workers, bus drivers, maintenance team. You're all the heartbeat of our schools. Our human resources department has done an excellent job coordinating a taco guy or man <laughs> um, for lunch for all of our schools and the district office staff members throughout the month. We appreciate what you do for our students and um, thank you from the whole Beaumont community. Lastly, on Friday, we had a wonderful evening honoring Beaumont USD Educators of the Year, Years of Service Employees, and our retirees. The committee, including HR team, Carol Francini, did a fantastic job uh, organizing the whole event. The team beautifully cre created the decorations and the program, and I know that took a lot of hard work um, that goes into this event. It was so fun seeing everybody dressed up and having such a good time. We're already looking forward for our next year's theme. As far as the calendar update, uh, lots of awards nights, promotions, graduations are coming up. The Beaumont High School Athletic Awards celebrations is happening tonight. On May 25th, Beaumont High School Theater uh, Academy Awards. On June 1st, Beaumont Adult School graduation in the morning at 9.30 and Beaumont High School Seniors Awards at night. June 6th, a regular board meeting. June 7th, Glenview High School, um, 21st Century and the uh, yeah, Alternative Education Program's graduation at 6 p.m. And on June 8th, Beaumont High School graduation at 6 p.m. And last day of June 8th would be the last day of school. And that ends my report, Mr. President. Thank you, Superintendent Kakish. Special recognition. The Board of Trustees of the Beaumont Unified School District will recognize Kirsten Cabalon, Balong, I can't say it now, Cabalonga, <laughs> 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 and Brax Braxton Schwartz for their service to the district as student board members during the 22-23 school year. Thank you. Board members, would you join me in the front, please? Front of the pages.
Yeah, that is. Oh, man. They're both? They're both going to the same college. Yeah, so I guess I'm going to get for you. It's a big campus. But there's several different ones. It's going to be hard to find a place to sleep. Uh, yes. We we'll have to since since uh, we don't have to follow the brown egg. Yes, we can. <laughs> it's a chicken. Oh, oh ways of Robert rules. That's the one we don't have to follow. So yes, you can. Uh, what you've accomplished here. Um, I've seen a lot of students come through here and you guys are really good at what you do. And I just appreciate what you've done and being a voice for the students in our district and uh, wish you the best of luck at UCLA. Good luck, can't wait to see how you do. I think ditto for all of us. Thank you. <laughs> Mrs. Laura said what we were all thinking. Thank you. And this is the first time, too, where we've had two board members serving yes. throughout a year. And uh, we're going to be trailblazers because we're going to follow the same model for next year. So Sounds thank good. you. Thanks, David. Mm -hmm. Agenda item 10.1, consent agenda. Actions prepared for the consent agenda are consistent with adopted and approved policies with the district and deemed routine in nature. They will be acted upon in one motion without discussion unless a member of the Board of Trustees requests that that item be removed from the consent agenda. In that event, it will be taken up in the order indicated on the main agenda. Do we have any items from fellow board members that would like to be pulled? Hearing none, call for a motion to approve agenda item 10.2. Second. Moved by Mr. Brown, second by Mr. Mitchell. Discussion. Oh, no discussion. Call for the vote. Agenda items 10.2 through 10.8 have been approved. Special legal and discussion items, 12.1. Receive a report on the 2023 Local Control Accountability Plan, also known as the LCAP, in conjunction with the budget overview to parents and conduct a public hearing. Dr. Brown. Good evening, Board President Sanchez. Board members, Superintendent Kakish, cabinet colleagues, community. Um, so here we are presenting the 23-24 LCAP. Seems like we just did this um, a few months ago, but uh, it's been a year. And uh, so we're going to go through and look at our 22-23 annual update. So what we accomplished this year, some of the successes and the highlights from this year's LCAP. And then we're going to look at some of the increased services that um, we're adding for the for next school year, the 23-24 school year. So the document itself um, is, as you all know, a very tedious um, and long document um, that follows the state template. And in that state template, there um, there are a lot of different factors to respond to in terms of reflections and highlights. Um, added features to the, the, um, to the LCAP template is um, looking at the actual expenditures and providing explanations to what we spent uh, additional dollars on or less dollars on and why that happened. And then uh, moving forward to the 23-24 uh, LCAP, looking at our increased actions and services. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Blasey to go through the LCAP presentation with you. Good evening, President Sanchez, board members, Superintendent Kakish, uh, cabinet members, and educational partners. 
Um, it is my privilege to um, present to you the uh, Local Control Accountability Plan and Annual Update, my third time doing so, and I'm very appreciative of that. I, per I wanna personally thank the Research, Learning, and Data Business, uh, Student Services, College and Career, Special Education, Instruction Departments, Site Leaders, Teachers, Support Staff, um, and Educational Partners for their feedback and attendance at school site council meetings, the family and community engagement uh, meetings, and LCAP meetings. Thank you to the California School Employees Association, the Beaumont Teachers Association for taking time out of their day to go through the LCAP with me. The collaborative efforts of the Beaumont educational partners made the LCAP process equitable, meaningful, efficient, and cohesive. Um, what you see in front of you is the overview of what I will be going over. Uh, this is uh, the table of contents of the actual um, LCAP presentation. What is the Local Control Accountability Plan? Uh, the LCAP is a three-year plan that describes the goals, action, services, and expenditures to support positive student outcomes and that address the state and local priorities. The LCAP is a tool for local educational agencies to set goals, plan actions, and leverage resources to meet those goals to improve student outcomes for unduplicated pupil populations first. The unduplicated pupil population makeup are our English learners, uh, our low-income or socioeconomically disadvantaged students, uh, that includes our homeless and foster youth. Unduplicated accounts of pupils who are English learners and meet income or categorical uh, eligibility requirements for free and reduced lunch meals under the National School Lunch Program. And this criteria is met under Ed Code Sections 2574B2 and 42238.02B1. The 2020 Three, 24 budget overview for parents. The budget overview for parents provides a comprehensive view of the projected general funds revenue and budgeted expenditures for the 23-24 school year, specifically utilizing the local control funding formula. The LCFF is a funding mechanism designed to allocate resources to school districts in a manner that supports student achievement, addresses the needs of high need students. In terms of projected general fund revenue, the total LCFF funds for the upcoming school year are estimated to amount to $147,615,894 with category, within this category, $22,293,935 is dedicated to LCFF supplemental and concentration grants while the remaining $125,321,959 represents all other LCF funds. Additionally, the budget includes the $21,052,578 from, from other state funds, $10,981,455 for local funds, and the $4,113,223 from federal funds. Overall, the total projected revenue for the 2023-24 school year is anticipated to be $183,763,150. The total budgeted general fund expenditures for the upcoming school year are projected to amount to $206,119,790. Of out of this amount, $25,495,925 is specifically designated for expenditures within the local control accountability plan. Moreover, the total at $33,063,688 is allocated for meeting the needs of high need students within the LCAP. Expenditures not included in the LCAP are expected to reach the $180,623,865 dollars. The LCAP state priorities and goals. Uh, what you see in front of you is the priorities that are listed by the state, and you can see the overarching in blue are the conditions of learning, in green, engagement, and student outcomes. Within those are the eight priorities that each school district must address. Uh, we will address parent involvement, student engagement, school climate under engagement, 
uh, student outcomes, student achievement under student outcomes, and basic services, state standards, and course access. Uh, expelled youth and foster youth are expected and addressed at the county level. The goals for, uh, the continued goals for the 2023-24 school year are as such. The uh, under uh, engagement is the climate and culture goal. Uh, under goal two with student outcomes and conditions of learning. And you will note as in each of the actions and under each goal that goal two and goal three were updated slightly. So plan summary of successes and um, identified needs. The 2022-23 LCAP has achieved significant success in multiple areas. The implementation of Panorama Universal Screener has resulted in notable improvements. Efforts to foster social emotional learning, social emotional development has created a supportive learning environment, enhancing students' well-being. The plan has prioritized high quality instruction from the beginning, ensuring students receive the best possible education, increased student access to career technical education, courses have provided valuable opportunities for career exploration and skill development. The establishment of the Beaumont Middle College High School has created a pathway for students to pursue rigorous academics and college readiness, the development of comprehensive English language arts, scope and sequence framework, along with counseling support and supported literacy and academic growth across all grade levels. Additionally, the focus on middle school support, sports, health support, early literacy intervention and literacy routines have further enriched students' educational experiences. The provision of professional development and leadership training has enhanced the skills and expertise of educators and administrators. Finally, the promotion of restorative practices as an alternative, alternative to suspension has contributed to a positive and inclusive school climate. Overall, the 2022-23 LCAP accomplishments have made a significant impact on student achievement and well-being. Identified needs. As you see in front of you, we have the identified needs and mathematics for best first instruction, intervention, and acceleration. You can also see that the California assessment of student performance and progress has noted from the 2021-22 school year data that uh, overall, all students are 13.3 points below standard. And then there are specific areas where we have student groups that are um, lower than the 13.3 uh, th points. And then in mathematics, uh, overall, all students were 55.3 points below standard. And then we have student groups that are lower than the 55.3 points below standard as well. And then our suspension rate, uh, all students at 2.5%. And then we have um, student groups that are lower than the um, average. And then our chronic absenteeism, additional targeted supports and improvement for all students are at 32.1%. And then there are specific student groups, uh, as you can see in order from highest to lowest are also uh, uh, have a high percentage for chronic absenteeism. So to address these needs, the district alongside educational partners has created action items to increase performance in English language arts. Mathematics, some of these actions listed in the LCAP are intervention teachers at each school site for ELA, mathematics teachers at each elementary school to directly focus on grades four and five, intervention and support mathematics teachers at the secondary level and increased funding for each school site to help incentivize students who improve over time. Also, to support student chronic absenteeism and behavior, the district has added counseling support a student services coordinator, and additional LVNs. I will elaborate more when we get to the increase and improve services section. Other actions that aren't directly uh, noted in the LCAP, uh, and what, what we will be doing is continuing our, the expanded learning opportunities and the summer program. Some learning opportunities are as follows. Followed, providing daily tutoring for students in second through eighth grade in ELA and math daily enrichment, homework support, and afternoon meals with um, the uh, CNS through before and after school programs, 30 additional nine hour days of student programs, intercession, camp, and summer school, and teacher training for summer school uh, curriculum. 
additionally some of the actions that indirectly support school sites and students are in the school plans for student achievement specifically each site that have additional targeted supports and improvement created actions action items that will address their school site needs also school sites along with the school site council develop their plans to enhance their student groups needs in academics attendance and behavior student services is continuing uh, are continuing to offer educational um, support regarding restorative practices verbal judo de-escalation everyday behavioral tools teacher behavioral tools professional crisis management uh, social emotional learning early detection of risk and compliance training for students uh, also additional training in title nine homeless and foster and continue to educate on aries analytics uh, with instruction we have also enhanced our educational practices and training through the educator effectiveness grant community engagement as noted on your screen in front of you we started our town hall meetings um, in September to go over the LCAP so that our educational partners really understood what it meant. So we slowly went through it over the first three months. And then starting in January, we started to talk about some of the things that we would like to see that could enhance what we're doing over time. We had the thought exchange survey. We will continue that. The Padlet interactive feed feedback. Um, bargaining units, Beaumont Teachers Association and California School Employees Association. Um, met with me to go over the entire um, LCAP. Uh, the District English Learner Advisory Committee met um, as a team and offered feedback. The LCAP Advisory Committee um, again met monthly and attended. I was able to, along with some other team members, attend the school site councils and coffee with the principals because last year one of the recommendations was to go out to the school sites, along with family and community engagement. This is uh, just a screenshot of the Padlet as to how educational partners could respond. This, the Padlet was created to gain specific insight return, pertaining to each goal. For example, educational partners appreciated the Family and Community Engagement Committee and the conversations about academic achievement, safety, attendance, and behavior. Educational partners um, are working towards a more connective environment between the district and the community and recommended more conversations about curriculum, instruction, equity, assessments, and school climate. Uh, for goal two, the Beaumont Teachers Association appreciated the continued efforts of the support in uh, lower, lowering class sizes and the sec at the secondary level, and the California School Employees Association recommended more professional learning opportunities during the October Professional Development Day. And the last example is school site leaders, teachers, and support staff are integrating the Ron Clark House system and strategies and appreciate the additional funding that has allowed sites to increase their capacity in creating a, con uh, a more inclusive environment. So with the thought exchange, as you see in front of you, um, this was a needs assessment with a very open-ended question. So this year, the LCAP team offered the survey uh, for approximately 45 days. 1,157 people participated, 693 thoughts were uh, created with 16,515 ratings with a ratio of 24 ratings per thought. Of the 1,157 participants, 29% were parents and families, members, 13% were teachers, 3% were school site support staff, and 65% were students. This year, uh, we offered a, um, a second survey question within the uh, um, thought exchange over um, arching question. And this year, the district included both school site participation and race and ethnicity. The percentage based on the student educational partner group is similar to the district demographic data. The enrollment demographic data is on page three of the district LCAP. Just note, also take a note that secondary schools also offered the thought exchange to their students, which allowed for student voice. The parent participation of English uh, learners, um, as you'll note that 32% have children that are English learners in the district. This is an increase of participation from the previous year, which was only 19%. And of the total responses of the thought exchange of parents or families that have students with disabilities, 28% have students with disabilities in the district and compared, this is an increase from the previous year's survey as well, which was only 
And these are some of the themes that came up with the thought exchange. Um, this is uh, listed and based on generative artificial intelligence. So what happens is that the system generates some themes based on similarities between the thoughts. Some of those, for example, um, breakfast, lunch, and meals, dual language, emotional well-being, communications, and conditions of learning, elective, safety, and security were some of those. And this graph represents the ratings. So for example, if you, on the far left, the orange, the passing periods, had an average rating of just over um, four ratings. And for example, and then English learning, English learners was about 3.5 uh, ratings percent. Educational partners input. The educational partners have provided several recommendations to the district. The partners emphasize the need to enhance safety and security measures at school sites, increase parental involvement in decision-making processes at school sites. The partners highlight the importance of supporting students' emotional well-being and its direct impact on their learning outcomes, calling for greater awareness and support in this area. Educational partners recommended providing additional training and resources to teachers and support staff to improve classroom climate and behavior management. The partners also stressed the importance of offering increased support in mathematics, uh, educa mathematics education for both parents and teachers. The support, the, continua con the continuation of class size reduction effort for secondary education and proposed considering class size reduction for grades four and five as smaller class sizes class sizes positively impact student engagement and individual attention. In addition, the partners recommend expanding programs for attendance recovery to help students overcome missed attendance. They emphasize the use of data to inform the decision-making process. Responding to students' requests, the uh, partners support the recommendation of revising the advisory uh, period at the high school. Students recommend exploring the options of increased uh, the number of accessible restrooms at the high school. The 2022-23 LCAP annual update. In front of you are just icons that represent the 15 action items for the 2022-23 um, LCAP. And the goal analysis um, that you would find on pages 48 through 59 that are of the four prompts at the bottom of the actions. Uh, the district is pleased to report an increase in student well-being compared to the nationwide results as evidenced by the recent data from Panorama. This improvement can be attributed to several initiatives and programs that have been implemented to support the diverse needs of our students within student services and at the school site. The district student services coordinator has been instrumental in providing additional supplies and services to families, particularly those who are socioeconomically disadvantaged, homeless, or foster youth. Assistant principals have also played a vital role by focusing on socio-emotional, socioeconomically disadvantaged foster youth and English learners, students with a strong emphasis on family engagement and homeless. In addition, the district has prioritized ongoing restorative practices training for counselors offering alternatives to suspension and promoting a positive and inclusive environment. Continuing collaboration with Project Kind and has allowed for provisions of essential services and supports to students. To enhance college and career readiness, the district has extended its supports to high schools, including Beaumont High School, Glenview High School, and 21st Century Learning Institute, culminating in an annual college and career signing day. This event facilitates students' exploration of college admissions, career pathways, and military opportunities. Recognizing the importance of effective communication, the district has employed a communications officer and enlisted the assistance of the Donovan Group for Public Relations. Through various communication strategies, including video communication, the district aims to engage parents and maintain a strong relationship with the wider community. Goal two for student outcomes. There are 15 actions that were provided in uh, the 2022-23 school year. And the analysis as, is as follows. The district has made significant strides in various areas of education. The district increased community and uh, parent participation and professional learning activities for staff. Additionally, student performance has improved across multiple measures and the failure rate for grade six courses has decreased. The district has also achieved a higher rate of English learner reclassification. 
professional development was provided district-wide on the October Professional Development Day. Additional teachers were allocated to support dual language immersion programs, reduce secondary class sizes, and provide full day kindergarten support. Elementary literacy intervention teachers were implemented at all elementary schools to provide targeted support. The district expanded its summer program for all students and implemented the advancement via individual determination program to enhance academic performance and college readiness. And goal three, conditions of learning. You'll note that um, th during the 2022-23 school year, there were six actions. There we are increasing them to seven next year. The, tw the, uh, the district initiated coaching for teachers and best first instruction, provided transportation services for our unduplicated pupil populations and students with disabilities, effectively created a plan to make sure all students have equitable access to technology. The oversight budget was effective in managing activities that are necessary for the operation of the district. Nope. Increased and improved services. The total local control funding formula funds budgeted for the, um, excuse me, for the 2023-24 school year are $1,407,614,894. The LTFF supplemental and concentration grants have a minimum proportionality requirement of $22,293,935, which is 17.94% of the total LCFF funds. The total budgeted amount for the 2023-24 fiscal year is $25,336,362, representing 20.39% of the LCFF funds. The positive difference between the allocated amount of the minimum requirement for the LCFF supplemental and concentration grant is $3,043,427. The increase in improved services for goal one, to increase funding uh, for ad additional behavioral health uh, therapists and eight student support specialists for elementary school. Additional, uh, adding an additional school resource officer, which is considered non-contributing. Student services coordinator, added an additional student services coordinator, added four additional licensed vocational nurses, and increased funding for school safety which is also a non-contributing action. For goal two, actions increased or improved services, uh, professional learning, increased funding for professional learning for staff, uh, additional teachers to support full day kindergarten from 7.25 to 11 positions, added eight math teachers assigned to each elementary school, increased funding for school sites to support academics, behavior, and attendance for unduplicated pupil population, added additional site-based instructional co coach at Palm Innovation Academy, developed and implemented a district-wide STEM academic program, and we will be developing that over this year and start the implementation. Additional support for K-12 programs by adding a clerk to support unduplicated pupil populations because of our growing population in the school district. And goal three increased or improved services, increased home to school transportation for low income students, increased access to technology um, to upgrade the Chromebooks, services and equipment, increased elevated achievement group services to improve our best first instruction for tier one initiatives and continue with breaking down the walls and added capturing kids heart for the Beaumont High School and added to both San Gregorio Middle and Mountain View Middle Schools to improve a sense of belonging. The 2022 LCAP budget. For the 2022-23 school year budget, the total, the, the total con local control funding formula fund were at $114,842,023. Within this amount, the LCFF base grant funds were $100,498,000. $391, providing foundational support to our district's educational program. 
the LCAP funds allocated for supplemental concentration grants met the minimum proportionality requirement of 14.27%, amounting to $14,343,632. These grants specifically targeted students with higher needs. The total budget for the LCAP in the 2022-23 school year was $18,828,194. This budget encompassed various initiatives and grant outlined in the local control accountability plan, including supplemental and concentration grants. There was a positive difference of $4,484,562 between the general fund and the minimum proportionality requirement, indicating that our district allocated an additional amount that was mandated, at, that met the mandated minimum towards the LCAP initiative. The total 2023-24 local control funding formula allocated amount of $147,615,894. This is the amount within the total of $124,238,260 is designated as LCFF based grant. The total budgeted amount for the school year is $25,336,360 and we represent a 20 0.39% contribution, which meets the minimum requirement, which is a positive exceeding at $3,043,427. These figures demonstrate our commitment to providing extra resources and support beyond what is mandated, ensuring equitable opportunities for all students. Question. Wow, thank you, Dr. Blasey. You had a marathon there, and I believe um, this is, I for the board to receive the information, and now we need to open up the floor to the public will be our next step. I think it's appropriate for the board to ask questions during the public, because they're still members of the public. That time. You can do it at the, at the public hearing or after before the public hearing to, to give direction to staff as they plan for their uh, template for adopted, with ato adopted materials on June 6th. Okay. Ooh. Now this is, this is one of those tricky items. Um, okay, so I need to open up the floor to the public. The, the floor is open to the pub for public comment at 6.53. This is where it says discussion. So uh, this is where I was going to allow the board to have. Yeah, you can do it either in between or yeah. after. Because otherwise, we're opening and closing it within the same minute, and yeah. that doesn't make. Anyone from the public have comments? Seeing none, we are going. I'm opening it to the board now for comments. Miss Laura. Thank you so much. <coughs> there, there we go. Okay. Thank you, Mina. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to start off by saying I, I really invested a lot of time in this. <laughs> um, so it was confusing at best for me a lot of the way through. So I, so I have a lot of questions. So um, what I might do is um, ask a few, and since we're not a, approving it tonight, maybe come back and talk to you and, and Dr. Brown and go through some of them. Um, if I spent, I don't know, a good 12 hours on this. <laughs> so um, there are some questions, though, that I'd like to ask you tonight. So with that, let me just start with, well, first of all, on your um, slides here, on slide 18, Thought exchange there? Short, yeah. Mine says 18. Why is it saying that? Uh, I think there was a difference, if I might say. Oh, because there's a I difference. I was thrown off by what I saw from the board packet that I received versus 
this presentation right. tonight. There was an extra page or slide, I should say. And the numbers were off. The numbers were off somehow. Because in my notes, I have certain slides are on different pages. So, so I Thanks, mean, Melissa, because I would have been like, no, really. I don't know. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right. So first, my first question for the um, slide is for passing periods, that's the highest rated, right? That was the highest rated comment or thought? Equal to um, school restrooms. Okay, so how did we address passing periods in the LCAP? Because I don't recall seeing anything in there about passing periods. I don't know what that means. That's a good question. Um, well, I'm, what we're going to be doing is working with the school site because that can be addressed directly in their school site plan. Because, the, But if, are you asking that we do address it in the actual LCAP as well? It's not in the LCAP, but we're, we're using the thought exchange for some of the themes in the LCAP. So are we putting it together? Are we, because if, they're, if that's one of their main thoughts, then it really needs to be in the LCAP, no? To is it okay if I ask questions on these first two? Yeah, no, I just, I, yeah, go right in. Okay. So, but I have a whole bunch, so. <laughs> so I did. <laughs> but I think that would be an important consideration is how were these determined? So it's based on the information that comes from the thought exchange. The system, the product itself decides, well, these are the um, most generated thoughts, so it pulls out keywords. And within those keywords, uh, we can assume maybe uh, that passing periods and school restrooms may have come from students. It could have come from parents in the community because maybe their, their children mentioned it to the parents. Uh, but it obviously is directly related to high school and or it could also be related to middle school as well. So, oh, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, to illustrate that a little bit better here. Um, if you go back to this slide here, um, you can see that the respondents, um, there were 811 from Beaumont High School. So um, knowing we don't have 811 staff members, that it was primarily students who responded to that. And the question that was answered was this question right here. So what do you think the Beaumont Unified School District is doing well and what can we focus on in order to improve um, state priorities of conditions of learning, student outcomes, and community engagement. And so when you go into the actual LCAP survey and you look at the participants and what they had said, passing periods was a, a big um, comment made by students. And, and all the comments were, we want longer passing periods. Uh, the passing periods are too short. We can't get to, get to uh, from one building to the other on time, um, were almost all the comments. And um, that, also led to the, the next one, which was lunches, mm -hmm. um, better options at lunches, uh, longer lunch periods. We want an hour for lunch. Um, the, you know, the, kind of the, the same thing, the same sense of um, the food choices. Mm -hmm. They wanted additional food choices and quality. So that's where a lot of those um, <coughs> thoughts came from. And, um, and so the idea is then to take some of those um, all that input and put it into, okay, what are the identified needs? Now, some of the needs we actually have already addressed. Right. So for example, the school restrooms, um, that was a early on in the school year because the first, um, it went out like in September. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so we had a lot of students because we had restrooms closed because we didn't have uh, yeah. staff um, to monitor the restrooms. And, um, and so we hired agency staff, we hired additional security because we did have a lot of security vacancies. So some of these things really have been addressed already, such as that. Um, we've opened up all the restrooms at the high school. We also, with opening the um, expansion buildings, has created additional restrooms as well. So some of those concerns aren't concerns anymore, but we wanna make sure we capture it because that's what we were given in the survey. So my question then being that is that, so if we're capturing it here mm -hmm. and we've addressed it, it's not addressed in the LCAP though. So that's where it gets a little confusing. So are we gonna use the thought exchange, all the information from it or just? 
parts of it to put in the LCAP? I'm not really. So when, when we know we've addressed an issue and we communicate that with the school um, and therefore it's communicated back to students, there's no need to spend any more resources from the LCAP dollars. The LCAP dollars are supplemental and concentration. They're very, they're a finite number. Right. Um, and so staff reviews, and that's the process as far as um, the state requirement is to review the feedback that you get. If you can address it in a different way, you can protect the supplemental and concentration right. grants to go directly to serving students. So um, as Dr. Brown has mentioned, the restrooms issue has been addressed, uh, the supervision issue has been addressed. When it comes to passing periods, it's a much more complicated thing. So we take it in consideration, right. we look at the build schedules, we look at things that can be negotiated if it really needs to be addressed. Right. So it's a longer term, mm -hmm. um, and sometimes staff cannot recommend a change because of all of the constraints that we have. So it does not make it to the LCAP either. Some of that can, can be communicated as we make the final plan adopted. Um, we can, one step that we will do is communicate it to our administrators and then our administrators are the ambassadors at the school site. So our high school principal can um, address these issues and talk about what the district did about them. They need answers. The students specifically like to a passing period, they will need um, to be given an answer that makes sense to why we couldn't address their issues. So that's, those are next steps after the LCAP is adopted. Okay, so for tonight, we're getting, we're getting slides with this information on it. So um, if they've been addressed, then maybe at some point you could have said, you know, these, these items have already been addressed, so they're not gonna be a part of the LCAP just so that we're not looking at it or a, a community member is not looking at it and saying, they have an issue with passing periods, but mm -hmm. there's nothing in the LCAP about that. So if it's already been addressed, somewhere along the line that needs to be communicated to the board because we're sitting here tonight looking at this. And it could be part of this presentation that we could have added, yeah. That's what I mean. That's it's just so, somehow we need to know that it's already been taken care of. Yeah. Okay, so, okay. Um, so one of, the, one of the things that I did notice also in the LCAP overall was a lot of uh, inconsistency in terms. So for example, on slide, well, I don't know if it's slide 32 now, but let's see. I'm just gonna give you an example. Oh yeah, so on goal 3.2, we have uh, low income or SED students, are they not the same? Yes, there's and so for, the, some, for the community, sometimes letting the community know that the socioeconomically disadvantaged also means low income for okay. the public. Because we use it different ways in the LCAP. Sometimes it says low income, sometimes it says SED. So I think it would be confusing to switch it up, to keep switching it up. Just my observation, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Going into the LCAP on page 19. Second to the last paragraph. Do you, we don't have, we can't put it on the screen though. That's too hard. We can actually, if you wanna open the attachment. I just don't know if we wanna do it that way or what. What, what would you like, what's the will of the board? Would you like us to Do you guys wanna it? see it? Yeah. We'll go ahead and bring it up. Okay. Page 19. 19. Let me just find my copy. All right. Second to the last paragraph. Okay. Student group showing, it's actually one paragraph up. Student group showing the most significant gaps compared to the district. What does compared to the district mean? Sh student group showing the most significant gaps compared to the district. Wow. District overall. So student group, meaning it could be white compared to the district overall. Student group showing the most significant gap in terms of diversity. Okay. Uh, 
uh, also on page 23. Something I'm very excited about. I was very excited about this. I had to make sure this was right, too. We are going to have local college visits for all 11th and 12th graders as an option instead of just our avid students. And I've been saying that for a very long time, and I'm just super excited to see it in here. Yeah. <laughs> Give yay for that. Let's see. Sorry. Susie, while you're on, on, on 23, do you mind if I, I'm going to throw a question out Go there? right ahead. Yep. Um, of course, for myself, uh, I'm focused on class size reduction. Uh, more likely, uh, the third bullet down, reduce class sizes at the secondary level. And I know that's addressed also on page 29 as well. Um, would we not want to put baseline information with, with such a statement? Because if we currently have 20 English teachers employed and we're going to reduce that class size, then I'm going to make an assumption that in a future report, well, we now we have 22 with uh, the same student, uh, student population ratio. So there's no baseline. Am I making sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I think I, I, it totally makes sense. Um, I think the, the complication there is that in 1920, there was no baseline established. Um, and this and is the third year of that plan. Right, and this is the third year. So what we, uh, what we could certainly do is when we redevelop, because um, this is the last year of the three-year LCAP, Next year, we're gonna have a, a really thorough goal analysis and look at, do we keep the goals? Do we change the goals? Um, what actions do we want to adjust? And what baselines do we want to um, put in? We, and this action, um, we don't foresee going away, so we could establish a baseline then okay, uh, that we can monitor. Because the baseline would be LCAP funded. Right, right. That's a, that's a very good point, though, yeah. Um, I don't know that we can add a baseline year two, year three outcome. Um, we, we might be, I, I, we'll have to look into it and talk with the county about that, how we do, maybe we do a year three outcome and that could start a baseline for the following year. But we'll follow up with the county. Thank you. Okay. Page 66, speaking of baselines. This has to do with students receiving at least one F or U in sixth grade. Uh, year two, we have foster youth, but we don't have it in year one or baseline. We can add that data. Okay. Um, there's another one like that too. I thought I had it marked, but there's an, there's another one where. Um, sorry, I thought I had it marked, and now I can't find it. But okay, page seventy-five. Um, this is for. 1920 ELA early assessment program, grade 11. So under the baseline, there's no socioeconomically disadvantaged or in year two and the same with the next group for math. <coughs> Can you repeat what you said again? I, I didn't hear the whole thing. Oops. For okay. page 75. 75. Was that on here? Yeah. So the socioeconomically disadvantaged, um, there's no baseline? For math? Or for both, correct. For, for math and ELA. Uh-huh. Okay. 
for 2019 plan. Mm -hmm. We can add that. I don't want to take up too much time. So I guess um, the other comment I would like to make, I mean, just about the LCAP itself, because I, I'm going to meet later, like I said. So um, I think we need to be really careful about how we word things so that it's understandable for the public. Um, some of this was a little confusing for me. And um, if we have any parents or anything looking at it, we want to make sure that it's understandable. Um, I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Thank you. Further comments from the board? Yes, Director Malloy. I'm good. Thank you. Rachel. Um, so, uh, and mine will switch between the presentation and LCAP. So, sorry, I'm not separating them out. I just wrote things down as I was going through this. So, um, Dashboard is listed as a source of data, right? Uh, California dashboard. So for the LCAP, um, it says the 2122 dashboard, uh, but for local indicators like iReady, it uses 2223 data. And I'm just wondering if we could have used in this document like 2223 data for our student population and demographic data because we kind of know it now. I mean, it's this late in the year, we kind of know what our data is for our student population. But it was, I think, for our student population demographics, at least at the beginning, and I'm sorry I don't have the page written down on my notes, but it was saying we use the 21-22 uh, data uh, or the dashboard just for that demographic. So I'm just trying to think about comparing the years. So the dashboard data that went public for 2021-22 uh, was public in December for last year. So the 22-23 school year, the 2022-23 school year dashboard will be published in hopefully in November in um, this coming year so for just dashboard data. Right. And I know, yeah, I know the state, how, how it goes. It's just, I was thinking we know what our... 22-23 data, student population and demographics. Okay, population. And so I, it would have just been nice to have it, the years consistent. Um, on the slide, as I think you're aware, I was going to ask a question about um, connecting the items listed as identified needs, uh, which I think is now on slide 11, being addressed with actions that are on pages or slides 30 through 32. And I think in your presentation, you, you um, link them. I think you were verbally, you said what the connections were between needs and actions. Um, I, I think for formatting, it would have <coughs> just been nice if, because there was a lot of information there given, if in the process, in the future, maybe uh, linking those identified needs with the actions. Um, so it's just visually, uh, we can see what's going on. Just a suggestion. Uh, attendance is obviously an identif identified area of concern in the LCAP. Um, so this may not be a question for you, I don't know. Do we have dedicated staff to make home visits? Yes, we do actually. We have um, in the LCAP, it is, um, <clears throat> it is uh, goal one, action five. Um, that is our, um, in that action, we have our parent engagement liaison who is, um, all that person does is student attendance. Um, they facilitate the SART and SARB um, processes, which is the school attendance review board, school attendance review teams. Um, they also work directly with the SROs, the two SROs, plus the third one that we're bringing on next school year as an, as an added service. All three do home visits for attendance uh, purposes. 
and then in that same action, 1.5, um, there are uh, halftime clerks at the middle schools and high school and um, three hour clerks at the elementary schools funded out of the LCAP just for um, communicating with parents to get kids back to school. The other um, part of that that we think uh, will will assist with um, attendance is the additional four LVNs, um, which will help with student illness and, and um, a primary role and responsibility that they will have is calling home, you know, following up with students who are not showing up and figuring out what's going on and why they're not attending um, and, and trying to eliminate some of that, those longer term absences due to illnesses. So. And, and I am really glad to see the LVN added uh, because I, for attendance, because obviously, um, you know, health issues are a major right. issue. I, and I was being specific about home visits because our, our families and all of us receive a lot of emails, parents swear, whatever it may be, uh, even letters in the mail, and those are pretty easy to ignore versus someone at your front door. Right. And so uh, making those home visits with some of those cases before it gets to, uh, ex especially a county district SAR right. uh, process, it would, I think, uh, might help attendance. Our, our very own director makes home visits too. <laughs> well, that's great to hear that directors do that. Yes. Yeah, that's really. And student I'm services coordinators. Really happy that they show that leadership. Um, okay. Uh, also, the addition for site based instructional coaches, uh, an addition for one at Palm Innovation Academy, correct? Okay. And then we're continuing with 10 instructional coaches based at the ESF. Um, I'd just like to say my opinion that I'm a supporter of our instructional coaches and I'm especially supportive of them being at the district, at the ESF, to go out to sites based on needs identified by sites and where they, there's no confusion about them being based at a site and being quasi-administrators or being used as quasi-administrators. So just my commentary on that. Um, There, see our SRO is back here. So there's also an area titled suggestions. And uh, the input on that was consider having this SRO engaged in classroom opportunities where uh, students can ask questions and offer informational short presentations about school safety. And also consider having ATS at summer wind trails. Um, are, will any of those two items be implemented next year? So um, we, we do not have ATS at Summerlin Trails, but that's something we can look into um, for the following year. The, the real reason, well, one of the reasons is because of the small middle school population um, of 350 or so students uh, versus the, the larger middle schools with, you know, nine, 950 to, and 1,200 at, at Sanji. Um, but the SROs, the additional SRO will be, um, will, will be uh, available to support Summerlin Trails. And we've done some work with the, with Beaumont PD in coordination with Riverside County Sheriff's Department because Summerlin Trails is in Cala Mesa and it's, um, we're, we're patrolled by the Riverside County Sheriff, but they are working in conjunction and partnership um, to where an SRO would be able to support Summerlin Trails in, in any kinds of needs. Um, and that's been a really nice uh, uh, accommodation, I guess, for us being that that we do have some trails in, in Cala Mesa. All right, thank you. And um, on page, uh, well, I don't know if it's page 47, but uh, proposed action 1.16, school safety and security enhancements. Do we believe this goal is still achievable based on the governor's proposed budget? That's where a lot more security cameras, sensors, et cetera, et cetera. Is that an achieve based on what yes. we recently heard and may revise? Yeah, and I'll, I'll um, uh, we, we've um, managed to budget very well for this project um, in terms of the learning recovery block grant and how we're using that so that we have freed up additional funds to secure, to complete the security, safety and security project um, at all of our schools. And I think uh, the next presentation will highlight the exact cut, which leaves still about $9.8 million in the recovery grant. 
learning recovery plan um, that we would be able to be creative with to support the What's the net goal and what our yes. plan are for security? Okay, great. And if I could, I, 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 we, we need to do a better job of really defining what contributing versus non-contributing. So in that goal in action 1.16, that is a non-contributing action. And what that means is that it it's doesn't contribute to the LCAP expen expenditures. So it's not charged to the LCAP. It's actually money we set aside um, in other funding sources to be able to spend that because we heard from the input of, um, of parents and families and community members and students that they want to see an investment in school safety and security. And so the LCAP is a good way of demonstrating that we are, we are addressing that need. We're not charging it to the LCAP expenditures, but, um, but we are doing it and we're using different funds for it. Um, so just la thank you for that explanation. And uh, just, I, I'm really happy to see what we're doing with the LCAP. Uh, um, I, th I think people and professionals like the LBNs, behavioral health therapists, all of that, the intervention teachers for math, it's, I really think it will make a difference. Um, I, I, we, I think we all hope it will. Um, so I'm personally, I'm, I'm very happy to see what's in there. I know it's a long document. I know the state kind of gives you this format in a sense, but what we put into that format, how we do it, just to echo a little bit about what Mrs. Lara was saying is really important to know our audience and uh, whether it's this presentation, um, which is the uh, public has access to or the document itself, which I'm not sure a lot of people will get into, but some may, uh, we do have control about the narrative that's written in there. So uh, it's just very important that we um, make it as clear and succinct as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Hearing none, public hearing is closed at 7.23. Agenda item 12.2, conduct a public hearing on 2023-24 proposed budget and provide an annual budget presentation. Good evening, President Tantray, Superintendent Katish, members of the board, cabinet colleagues and community. I am Penny Harbauer, Assistant Superintendent of Business Services, and I am joined tonight by Carmen Ardonis, who's our Director of Fiscal Services, and we are here tonight to present to you the 2023-24 preliminary budget. And included in the report tonight, we'll, we will go over what we are estimating uh, to complete the 22-23 school year with our revenues and expenditures. So a few things, uh, some key factors that we build our budget on are some assumptions and the three major things for the 23-24 preliminary budget that we wanted to point out is that as of the Governor Newsom's May revise, he is anticipating an increase to our COLA, which is a little bit higher than what we presented to you at second interim and what we have been projecting in our multi-year projections on. We also have uh, a second item, which is the unduplicated pupil count. You'll see that that number has uh, shown a slight increase in what we have projected in the previous years. Number three would be an increase to enrollment. Um, and we are pre, uh, proposing that we project in our preliminary budget a 3% growth. In the past, we have been very comfortable and conservative with the 2% growth, but I will show you a little bit uh, slides later to show you what our growth has actually been so that we have increased the assumption to a 3% projection um, because of those numbers. And we also are projecting in these assumptions a 93% uh, average daily attendance rate for our students that are coming to school. There are no significant changes in the um, STRS and FERS retirement rates. 
However, you'll see there is an increase from current year and estimated actuals to next year. So we had put those in our projections for second interim. So this is the slide I was talking about on our enrollment. So the California Basic Educational Data System, or CBED, is an annual data collection that is administered in October each year. The purpose of this collection is that they track students and staff and some aggregate data on students and staff and they use those numbers in October for us to gauge um, where we are with enrollment. So in CBED's column for 21-22 to the CBED's date in October for 22-23, we had an enrollment increase of 560 students, which is approximately a 4.9% increase. Now, in Beaumont, because we are one of the fastest growing districts in the state of California, there's movement all year long. So looking at it even as of May 8th, as we were trying to prepare all of these reports for you, the enrollment has actually increased from last year's 654 students or approximately 5.7%. So that's why in our assumptions, we felt comfortable with the projections, the development and growth as we've been hearing from Lisa as she gives us these updates that we are gonna see a 3% increase and that is what we based our revenues on for our projections. Um, looking at the TK-12 bolded number in that projected budget in the 2023-24 column, we're basing our enrollment number on 12,089 students. Uh, we do serve, however, um, other programs that you see there on the report, so we want to recognize that we actually serve 12,366 students, but our local control funding formula is based on that 12,089 students, and with that being said, our current attendance rate in 22-23 fell slightly to 92% from where we were prior to COVID at 95%. We were actually inching up to about 96% at that time. And so we've had to adjust our budgets down as we've brought to you our interim reports that we are currently sitting at 92. But we are working on um, attendance and focusing on that. So we did do our assumptions for next year's budget and the two out years at 93%. Okay, so moving into the numbers again, this is uh, re this report shows where we're projected to be in 22-23, and then what our budget will be in 23-24. So starting with the combined uh, general fund revenues, we are projecting a decrease from current year to next year of 11. Point million dollars, and that is a net of the unrestricted and the restricted general fund. So on the unrestricted general fund, we are actually projecting an increase of about $18 million, and most of that is in the LCFF resources, and that again is due to the 8.22% COLA, and also the 3% enrollment growth that Penny just talked about. On the restricted side, we're actually projecting a decrease and the decrease in the federal revenue is due to the COVID relief funds being one time, therefore we're not you know, continuing them on to the next year. And then the state revenue, the decrease there is due to the um, one time block grants that we received in 22, 23, uh, but not receiving in the, in the budget year. And um, as mentioned earlier, we did have Additional information from the May revise regarding the block grant, block grants, which we'll, we'll go over at the end of the, the presentation. So this chart shows all of our revenue sources for our district. And as you can see, the LCFF revenue is our biggest resource. And that again is based on student attendance. The unduplicated pupil percentage, again, this year is 65.35, uh, and that includes the students that are eligible for, um, uh, that are income eligible for meals, free and reduced meals. Uh, they're English learners or foster youth. And this year, 
that is 65.35% of our total student population. And again, this, is, this rate is used on a three-year average to calculate our supplemental and concentration grants, um, which are used to fund the LCAP that we just heard about. So moving into the expenditures, our expenditures are projected in, uh, to be an increase of about $18 million. The majority of this increase is in certificated and classified salaries and uh, employee benefits. Um, and this again is due to the positions that we've added for growth in both regular ed and special ed, and then of course this step increase. On the unrestricted side, and we've already talked about this, the salaries, and then for books and supplies, those increases are due to uh, instructional materials, including textbook adoptions, and um, safety, the safety and technology plan supplies. For services, those, um, m a lot of that increase is due to the services um, in the LCAP, and then for capital outlay, that is budgeted expenditures for technology um, and the safety um, plan equipment for that. Contributions have also increased. The contributions from the unrestricted general fund have also increased, and I'll go over that in a, in a future slide. On the res restricted side, we've talked about the uh, salaries increasing. Um, for our restricted accounts also. For all of the other category, categories, those expenditures have decreased and that's due to spending down our one-time funds. So this chart shows all of the categories of our expenditures broken down by percentage. And uh, the biggest expenditure for our district is uh, salaries and benefits, which is approximately 78% of our total budget. This table shows the total um, full-time equivalent positions uh, in the current year compared to the budget year. The increases to the BTA group include the FTEs that were mentioned earlier and the LCAP. They also include uh, positions for growth in both the regular ed and special ed. And then the increases in the CSEA group um, are also there to support that growth. So COVID relief dollars came from both federal uh, resources and state resources. And for our district, that was $34.3 million. Although we have until September 2024 to spend all of those dollars, we are projecting to either spend or encumber, encumber those funds completely by June 30th of 2023. And this chart shows how those dollars were spent. The majority of those dollars were spent for student uh, technology and supplies, and then also for staff cost. Here's the slide regarding the contributions. So our contributions have increased or projected to increase for next year. A large part of that is the increases to our special ed program. And then routine restricted maintenance is based on 3% of our total expenditures. So as our total district or general fund expenditures grow, then of course that 3% is a larger dollar amount. There's no significant changes to transportation. Um, and then also just as a reminder, 22-23 is the first year that we receive the um, transportation reimbursement funds, which that lowered our overall contribution to the transportation program. So moving on to the ending balance, the uh, net of the revenue and the expenditures described in the previous slides added to the beginning balance equals the projected ending balance. For the estimated actuals, um, our projected ending balance is slightly higher than what we presented to you at the second interim. And the projection for the 23-24 uh, budget, the ending balance is projected to be about $22 million less. The components of the ending fund balance, um, we'll go over each one of those categories. So starting with the restricted funds, 
these are the projected ending balances that we're um, projecting for the 23-24 school year. And they will remain in the ending balance until they're identified for specific expenditures. Here's the, this is the continu continuation of the restricted balances. It's about $10 million less than what we're ending the 22-23 school year with, and that's due to spending down some of the, some of the one-time funds. Regarding the commitments, um, with the adopted budget for 22-23 school year, we brought forward um, a resolution that constrained some of the ending fund balance for these specific purposes. Included in that was 8.33% additional uh, reserve for economic uncertainties. And in the next board meeting uh, coming up in June, we will bring forward another resolution to constrain some of the ending balance of the 23-24 budget for these same purposes. And then moving on to the assignments, some of the ending balances that we're ending the year with this year will be, uh, are actually budgeted as expenditures in the 23-24 school year. That's why you see a lot of zeros in there. And then uh, the remaining resources will be budgeted once they're identified for specific resources, or specific expenditures. So this total assignment is about $700, the ending balance is about $700,000 less than what we're projecting um, our ending balance to be this year. And then finally, the last component of the ending balance is the reserve for economic uncertainties. So we're re we are required to have a 3% reserve based on our, um, the size of our district. And then in addition to that, um, as I mentioned earlier, Part of the commitment is the board resolution, which committed 8.33% additional to the 3% for a total of 11.33% as the reserve for economic uncertainties. And um, in the current year and in the budget year, our ending balance is, is enough to cover the, the total 11.33%. So this is a summary of all of the funds. Our district operates a $228 million budget, and of that budget, we're uh, projecting to carry over approximately $85 million. Okay, so moving on to our multi-year assumptions and projections. Um, calculating our budget for next year and then projecting out two additional years is part of a requirement of Assembly Bill AB 1200 and AB 2756. So basically the projections are as reliable as the information as we know today and we want to make sure that we capture that, make sure any of the underlining factors that may change in the future, then we document that and we bring that forward to you as changes happen in each interim or an audit at actuals as we go through the next several months. Once he adopts the budget, we will be bringing that back to you. So each time we have a reporting period, we update those multi-years and the planning factors that go into that, and we use the school services dartboard that shows us all of these rates and what they're projecting them to be is what they know today. So a lot of times when we hear school services talk, they pretty much present to us and tell us they're exactly wrong but approximately right when we're presenting to you. I love to hear Matt say that when he says that because I laugh every time um, because that is truly the case. So we're presenting to you today what we know and what, um, what we were given um, at our second interim and as we made changes that may revise. Um, there were some things like Carmen mentioned. We have a slide to show you and some of the adjustments that we will be making at unaudited actuals if that's what he adopts in his budget. Um, so what we wanted to point out, as I mentioned before, our budget year, we're looking at a COLA of 8.22, which is slightly increased from 8.13. And then you'll notice in the subsequent years, we have uh, in our assumptions 0% COLA. And so what our pattern we have is that once it is brought to adoption and we move forward, then we bring that COLA 
into our revenue and we adopt that in our plan. So the projection that he had in the dartboard is 3.94% for 24-25 and 3.29% for 25-26. Not quite the high rates that we have now, but this is a conservative budget that we move forward with the zero COLA. And as we mentioned before, there is an increase of 3% of um, growth in each year. And then we left the average daily attendance at 93, but our goal is to increase the attendance because one thing we noted was 95 prior to COVID, we were at 96. But if you look at, bring back that 12,089 students, if we actually increase back to 95, it, it's about um, 273 more average daily attendance we can credit and that's $3.2 million for us. So that's a lot of money. So we're inching it up that 1% as we're working with families and students um, to return to school every day. Um, <laughs> looking at our uh, multi-year projections combined just in some totals of the revenue expenditures and the net increase decrease. As Carmen mentioned, we are meeting um, our obligation for that 11.33 in the current budget year, the second budget year, and then the third budget year, we are meeting the state required 3%. So we are able to file a positive budget. Um, and in the third year, we're looking at a 5.64%. So we're well over that 3% required in what we're presenting to you for preliminary budget. Our unrestricted budget, pulling those apart as Carmen did in our budget slides. Um, we are looking at the fact that general fund is anticipating expenditures to exceed the revenues. And each year you'll notice in the budget year, it's 13.1 million, 10.3 in year two and 17.5 in year three. And when you look at restricted, because of those one-time dollars that they're um, giving to us, that they gave to us this year, they actually gave us a three-year timeline in those to spend those dollars down. Some of them are different. Each one is different like the COVID dollars were. You had a certain amount of time frame to spend them. So you'll notice in our projections, restriction, uh, restricted resources, we usually spend down in that year. We spend them down and we don't carry them over, but you'll notice that we do have carryovers and we're projecting out expenditures because we do have the three years to spend them. One key thing we always want to look at at all times and it's critical for us to look at often um, and we watch daily in the fiscal department and that is what cash we have on hand and the projections of cash that we are going to have on hand. And what you see here is we're projecting for 22-23 to end with almost 71 million and at the end of next year we will end with 52 million. So we are now getting to the slides we referred to with the May revise and what the governor was proposing in that May revise, that he's talking about um, the budget coming forward at over $2 billion less in revenue than what he had projected in January. So what he was looking at is trying to hold as much as possible in that LCFS and trying to balance that budget by reducing the block grants that he gave us and that he had allocated in January. So what does that mean for Beaumont in our budget? What you see before you in those ending fund balances we talked about and those designated dollars, uh, we showed that we were receiving in the arts and music block grant almost 7 million, 6.8 million. He's projecting a 50% reduction. So what that means for Beaumont is that we actually will only receive the 3.3 if that comes forward. And then the learning recovery block grant, this is, this is Kind of a controversy because we received the whole uh, pot of money of 14.4. So when they're talking about it, what is that going to look like if he does do a cut and <coughs> reduction and brings that forward? So that's some of the conversations that's going on. But what that means for Beaumont is, May's mentioned also that we will still be able to keep about $9.8 million of that. So we will make those adjustments once that budget's adopted and make some shifting and we have some ideas on how we can do that within those one-time dollars and still stay solvent and move forward with our plan. And we are at the 
end of our budget presentation for the preliminary and are open for questions and the public hearing for comments. Open to public public hearing. hearing is opened at 746. Discussion from the public? Any input? Seeing none, discussion open to the board members? I have a question. Ms. Lara? Can we go back to slide 18? So, um, like our projected ending balance seems like it keeps going up. Am I right or wrong? It's um, so when we brought this forward in the second, at the second interim, it was about 75 million approximately. So it's about a million dollars more than what we. So, I mean, I guess over the years, I mean, it, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what I'm trying to ask you, but. So, um, so a big reason for that number right there is our one time dollars. And as Penny mentioned earlier, the, four, the whole $14 million we've actually received and that is right now reserved in the ending balance so that we could uh, pay for those projected expenditures in the future. Okay. And, and so our what goal wasn't to, to have a high ending balance, right? Mm -hmm. So um, one of the reason that the balance grew over the COVID years is we received a lot of one-time dollars and we didn't, we planned to spend it in phases um, moving forward, though, we um, plan to spend the dollars in the year that the students earn those dollars. So we will meet the 3% reserve and the policy that the board set forth, which is 8.33 on top of that in the budget year, mm -hmm. and continue to balance um, our budget to accommodate keeping that much in the fund balance. Uh, with the surprises, though, in the next couple of years, um, we will have to be very cautious about how um, we carve out the dollars that are specifically mentioned in the May revision. Um, I think, I don't know if there's time to adjust that for the adopted budget. We'll, we'll make sure that we um, take that in consideration as we adopt the budget on July 1st by the governor. We might bring back to you an updated budget within 45 days because if he really moves forward with that, that will be a material impact on our budget, but it's not gonna change expenditures because it's, it's just sitting in the fund balance as they mentioned. Uh, I think the district also was wise to not spend the music and arts grants. Um, we really didn't anticipate that it was gonna be cut, but we did anticipate that if we were to use them in the music and arts um, services, it would be considered part of our baseline in Proposition 28 would have to be supplemental to that, which means on you know, added expenditures. But we strategically were going to spend the one-time dollars on one-time things like startup costs for equipment and use the Proposition 28 for staffing. Mm -hmm. So that saved us because now we can definitely cut the $3.5 million approximately easily because it hasn't been spent. It's also sitting in the fund balance. So those will help, um, we're still, above our 11.33%. Um, so we, we can bring you back updated information at the sec first interim report as the budget gets finalized. The so first interim, and this is additional information, but the first in interim is gonna be after the receipts of taxes in October. And that's the main reason why all of these shuffling in the budget are happening because the governor and the staff are not able to, to estimate revenue accurately because of the delay in individual tax returns and uh, the extension to October 15th. Uh, that's the main reason. And I, I wanna just go back on record and, and let everyone know that 50% of California revenue is being paid by 1% of Californians that are the wealthiest. And so that's a big percentage to be so vulnerable based on income tax returns. So um, we're gonna be watching that carefully. And going back to the slides for the um, a new fund balance al allocation, the restricted slide shows 30 million of that 76 million is restricted funds. 
Mm -hmm. and they're allocated to stay in that same resource and they're carried forward. Okay. So just of that 76, 30 million is restricted. Okay. And then we go into the commitments and like what Carmen had mentioned, we have the 8.33, which is 16, almost 16 million of that. Mm -hmm. So we, we designate that the curriculum that we move forward and then um, supplemental, when we don't spend all that LCAT, we have to leave it in the LCAT and we spend it now next year. And then we do the assignments, which are the smaller balances that are specific uh, liability areas. So when we add money from the general fund to put into the LCAP, we can use? The carryover. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. 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 Any Follow other discussion, discussion questions from the board? Public hearing is now closed at 7.51. Feeling of the board about taking about a five minute recess. Are we okay or do you want to continue? Whatever you need to do, I'm okay either way. Mm -hmm. Twelve point three. Did, Mr. Conduct Sanchez, a, did huh? you close the did you close the public hearing? Yes, I closed it. You did. Yeah, okay. I closed it at seven fifty one. Okay, thanks. Twelve point three. Conduct a public hearing regarding the district's budget, reserves, transparency requirements under Education Code forty two one twenty seven. The meeting is open to the public. Let's have a presentation first. Is there one? Okay. It was part of the, the fund balance presentation. Understood. It is open at 7.53. Discussion from the community. Hearing none, discussion from the board members. Hearing none. Public hearing is closed at 7.53. Agenda item 12.4, adopt resolution 22, 23, 26 for the spending determination of the 23, 24 education protection account, EPA fund. We have a motion. So moved. So moved by Ms. Lara. Second. Second by Ms. Williamson. Discussion? Hearing none, call for the vote. Agenda item 12.5, adopt resolution 22, 23, 28, establishing the maximum and actual special tax rate and authorizing the levy of special taxes for the 23, 24 fiscal year for the community facility district number 2018-1, 2020-1, and 22-1, and the improvement areas and or zones contained therein. Do we have a motion? So moved. Moved by Mr. Brown. I'll second. Second by Ms. Lara. Discussion. Hearing none, call for the vote. <coughs> Item carries. Human resources. Agenda item 14.1. Approved certificated personnel assignments order listed on the report dated May 23rd, 2023. Do we have a motion? So I'm moved. Moved by Ms. Laura. We have a second. I'll move. Mr. Second. Mitchell. Second. Nothing here. Discussion? Hearing none, call for the vote. Item carries. Agenda item 14.2, approve the classified personnel assignments order listed 
on the report dated May 23rd, 2023. Do we have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Williamson. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Brown. Discussion? Hearing none, call for the vote. Item carries. Agenda item 14.3, before I read it, there has been a request from cabinet to do an amendment. I will continue to read as listed though. Approve the administrative personnel assignments ordered listed on the report dated May 23, 2023. Ms. Castillo, you have a? Yes, we'd like to amend the, uh, the effective date, the start date from July 1st to June 5th, 2023. If there's no objections, the, the amendment will be read into the record as what again? July? June 5th. June 5th. June 5th. And that's to allow transition time with the director. So I motion to approve the administrative personnel assignment order with a revision of June 5th as a start date. I'll second. Moved by Ms. Law as amended. Second by Mr. Mitchell. Discussion? Hearing none, call for the vote. Uh, item carries. Business services. Approve a license for early, excuse me, approve a license for entry agreement with the Tri Point Homes to allow for district consultants to provide testing required by the California Department of Education for the pur proposed new school site in the Atwell development. Do we have a motion? So moved. Moved by Ms. Law. Second. Second by Ms. Williamson. I have a question. Discussion? Um, yes, real quick. Um, recital B, it states the district plans to purchase property for development of an elementary school, but it is possible to build a TK-8 on the 20-acre site. That's cor correct? Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Thank you. And on a side question, this will allow Beaumont Unified School District to have a, a uh, strong, equitable tie to property that's within the Banning city limits? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. <laughs> All those call for the vote. I have a, a question. Yes, Mr. Brown. Sorry. Um, we had mentioned earlier about the relationship we have with Riverside County Sheriff's Office and because we have a property in Hermosa. Hermosa, is this true another relationship with the Banning Police Department? Because we know the property was a development in the area. Yes, it is. They actually have been participating in our monthly meetings that we have with the outside agencies already. Mm -hmm. Vote was called. Item carries. Good point, Mr. Brown. 16.1, receive a report from the California School Employees Association and its chapter 351. We have a representative. 16.2, receive a report from the Beaumont Teachers Association. Chase Moore did give a report before closed session. 16.3, receive a report from the Beaumont Administrators Confidential Management Employees Group. Do we have a presentation or comments? They are waived tonight. Thank you very much. That will be noted. 16.4, receive a report from board member Susie Long. Yes. Um, Thank you again for all the work on the LCAP. I know it's a, a lot to do, um, and I do appreciate the time and effort that's been put into it. Um, also, uh, I attended the employee recognition dinner on Friday. That was fun. That was great to see everybody and, and that they were able to relax and, and be celebrated. It was good. Um, also, I took a visit at Sundance, and Mr. Mitchell and I did with um, Mrs. Katouche, and 
Uh, we were able to see, I don't know if we saw it or did, I actually went the week before you guys too, but um, I was able to see the literacy intervention class. Mm -hmm. Did we see that mm -hmm. together? Yeah. So um, that was actually a really neat thing to see uh, the, the um, I don't know the word I'm trying to find right now how focused they were on literacy. So it was really good and the kids were really engaged and it was good to see. I can't wait to see that kind of thing for math next year. It's gonna be cool. Um, and I wanna thank Penny for all your hard work and dedication to our district. You will be missed and um, I wish you nothing but good luck in your future endeavors and we always have a fun time down here. <laughs> And I'm ready for graduation. <laughs> <laughs> Receive a report from Mr. Jeff Brown. So I also wanted to mention the amazing um, retirement and Recognition, the, the, I'm trying to think of the number of years. Years, that years of service. Years of service, but it was uh, 20. 20 and more. Uh, it was a really great celebration. It was, uh, it was very well done. It was very well put together. It was a very classy thing. It was, it was mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Um, uh, I also wanted to mention the uh, student of the month, student of the year celebration. Um, it was a uh, bright, shining moment. <laughs> <laughs> for <laughs> for the uh, for, for the board members, right? Uh, um, and for the students, I mean, uh, they all worked really hard all year long. And uh, some of the stories I've been to a couple of the breakfasts where they talk about the stories, and some of the stories from these kids, it's just absolutely fantastic. And it's again another opportunity for us to work cooperatively with cooperatively with. Banning Unified and the city of Banning. So that's always a great thing for us. Um, there's a lot of, uh, as everybody knows, there's a lot of little cross town rivalry stuff, but it's nice when we get together and we can all be friends. Um, but it's okay to still be rivals. Um, uh, and the, I have been to a couple of the different sites for the uh, employee appreciation, and it has been much appreciated by all of the employees that I've talked to. Um, it's been much appreciated by me as I attend them, so. <laughs> um, and yes, looking forward to um, uh, the graduations. That's gonna be awesome this year. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Board member Melissa Williamson. Good job. Um, so I, I kind of told myself this year as a new board member that I just gonna go to everything. And so I have gone to <laughs> anything that's in the evening because this is also a busy time of year at my school. Um, and then my thought process was that next year I could, I could kind of determine what to take off the plate because obviously you can't do everything. Um, but I haven't determined what that could be because everything has really been exceptional. And the more I'm getting to know the staff and students and families, the more that Beaumont just becomes part of me. And I love that. And so I, I don't know, I think it's just gonna have to be like this every year where we, <laughs> I just go to everything because um, it's all been exceptional and unique. Every different thing is unique. Um, I ended up standing in line with Jacob, one of the students of the year um, from Beaumont High. We, we were getting food at the same time and obviously but at that point I didn't know he was the student of the year. I just thought this guy's real, this student is really cool. You know, he was fun to talk to, very um, good at conversation and um, so I didn't know I was talking to a celebrity at that point but um, I could see why he would be honored in that way and that event was, it was very, um, hot, um, but <laughs> I mean, a small sacrifice to make to, to just celebrate these students and honor them for a job well done. Um, and my husband and I had a blast at the retirement and recognition dinner. 
Um, I think a lot of things are enjoyable, but maybe not fun as an adult. <laughs> and we really had fun. So the dancing afterwards, seeing all the staff just let loose, um, it was a really fun evening and well done. I mean, I, very impressed. So good job. And I can't wait. I'm just thrilled about everything <laughs> coming up as well. So, yeah, thank you. Next report from our board member, Mr. Mitchell. Uh, again, thank you to Kristen and Braxton for your service, and um, it's been a great year with having you on, on the board, so thank you so much. Um, a lot of celebrations have been mentioned, so I won't go through them all. Uh, again, for the classified appreciation week going on, and um, I haven't had tacos yet, so I'll get out there. Last couple here. Uh, so finally, uh, thank you, Penny for all the work you've done for our district um, and our community, our students, and um, people don't know what it is, and uh, everything involved until you walk into, in the shoes. Um, so I know we've been at it for a few years together, so I really appreciate you. Thank you and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Mitchell. Well, this year I did miss the celebration or recognition and uh, it, it was missed. I would have enjoyed slapping some skin, cutting a rug, and bringing out my favorite flapper to uh, <laughs> <laughs> to show you all up as we did the Charleston. Because she is a tall glass of water. <laughs> you know, Daddy O. Now, <laughs> but while I. <laughs> what happens when your grandparents raise you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, I'm having some flashbacks now. Uh, I was up in Sac Sacramento, and there was some serious conversation I wanted to bring back. Um, one had to deal with cyber uh, ransomware that's going on in, in the community or within school districts. Um, there, is a new, there is a group that's called the Corporation for Education Networks Initiative in California, uh, Scenic and I'll forward this information on to our superintendent. But even our neighbors next to us in Val Verde, uh, one thing they are recommending, not Val Verde, but uh, the organization is saying not to keep this stuff quiet, to, be, to bring it public as quickly as possible because what they're going after is not actually what little Johnny got in his history class. They're going after individuals, uh, their names, their social security numbers, date of birth, the records that we upload, the employees that we upload into, let's even say Brennan Bridge, um, they're, they're going after personal information of employees. And while the district is scrambling to open up Aries because it's been locked down, they're, they're in <coughs> another back door taking our personal information. And the reason why they're, they're making the recommendation to go public is so that employees, board members as well, is that they can use uh, th those anti-theft protections that are out there. Uh, I'm, I'm forgetting them at the moment, but if your s social security or your credit card is breached, uh, lock theft law or lock theft, I'm getting the acronym at the moment, but th so that you can activate th those or let those companies know that there was a data breach and then they can start monitoring the dark web to see if your social security, your children's social security numbers are starting to float around. They're also recommended that there that such information be put on two different drives. One that is is not networked through a county, but uh, e e even being uh, housed in, in paper form. So um, that was a that was a big topic because uh, of the amount of money that was that was going through. Um, other than that. Again, as it was echoed, a lot of congratulations to the people that are uh, that have served our, our district. Penny, thank you very much for doing an excellent job and uh, moving our district forward during expansion and, and building. Uh, our student representatives, again, this is a unique, a unique experience for you, and I'm glad um, that you stuck with it. And I know some of these nights were short and other, ni other nights were long, like tonight, it was a long <laughs> night. Um, that, that, that's always appreciate, appreciated. 
that meeting, the business of the people is concluded and we are now adjourned at 10 minutes after eight.